This morning, we will be reading from Mark 5, 1 through 20. You can find that on page 862 in your blue Bibles. Jesus and his disciples went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with the stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is, it? What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons, sitting there, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. Thank you, Harry. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jonathan, and uh, I'm a pastor here at Surgeon Alliance Church, and just so thankful that you're here to join us this morning. We are continuing our series through the Gospel of Mark, entitled The Son of God, and we've been journeying through the past several weeks through the first four chapters in Mark here. I'm going to jump into what uh, Harry just read for us, which is a wild story uh, this morning. You know, in the 1800s, about the mid to late 1800s, there was a, a Belgian man, a, a Catholic priest, who uh, in, who was sent out from Belgium uh, out to the islands of Hawaii. Uh, he had traveled, of course, the many weeks that it would take to sail down to uh, Hawaii, and this was a land far from his European homeland, so different from anything that he had experienced growing up and had known his whole life. It was unfamiliar, it was uncomfortable, it was unknown to him. And he had been, for many years, praying that he would be uh, sent out from uh, his mission out into uh, an international placement. He, he wanted to go out and to be the hands and feet of Jesus um, outside of his European homeland. What would cause someone to want to do this? What, what, what would cause someone to go to the ends of the earth in this way? You know, the story that we, we just read here, this is Mark's first account of Jesus traveling into these Gentile, non-Jewish lands, into these pagan territories. Jesus is taking his disciples on what essentially amounts to a short-term missions trip on this day. 
and he is placing them in enemy-occupied territory, if you will. This is far from anything that they have ever grown up with, everything, anything that they've ever known, probably anything that they've ever experienced. They are going into a land where there are practices and beliefs and customs and different gods that are honored than what they had known growing up. As Dorothy put it in The Wizard of Oz, you remember that line as they step into the land of Oz, Toto, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. You can imagine the disciples as they step off the boat, looking at Jesus and thinking to themselves, we are not in Galilee any longer. The journey that they would have taken was about a two-hour trip across the lake. And if you look at the, the passage, just the chapter just before this passage, you'll find the story of Jesus calming the storm. And so here we have Jesus fresh off of calming this external storm in the surrounding uh, natural happenstance of what they're experiencing. And he's going to go in this story to calm an internal storm in a particular person on that day. This story is found in Matthew and Mark and Luke's Gospels. And what they do is they show us a Jesus who goes out of his way to search for those who have never had a thought of searching for God themselves. A God who cares to travel far and beyond what is expected, what is thought that he would do. Once they arrive on the shores, Matthew's account makes it clear that this was the other side. This was a different world. They are not in a familiar, comfortable place. They are in a land of the Gerasenes, a place on the eastern shores of Lake Galilee, that is more Greek than Semitic, more pagan than Jewish. And like I said, there are influences and beliefs and practices here that are completely antithetical, opposite to the God of the Bible that these disciples have known. Does that sound familiar? Living, coming to a place, living in a society where the practices and beliefs are antithetical to that which we know from the scriptures. Part of what Jesus is doing here, I think, is bringing his disciples here to show them what it means to be a catalyst for bringing change and for changing what is. And it's a great reminder for us that this story is a great reminder that just because something is doesn't mean that it has to stay that way. Just because something is a current experience doesn't mean that it has to stay that way. That isn't the end of the story. Jesus is on the move. In this story, Jesus is on the move in this church. Jesus is on the move in this world. He is crossing shores. He is crossing boundaries. He is going to people and places that don't even know who he is. They have yet to experience the loving presence of a father who sends his son to die for them. Jesus is on the move, and he crosses lakes and oceans and galaxies to come. And when he comes on these shores that day in chapter 5, it doesn't take long to get a response from the inhabitants or from one particular inhabitant in particular. Look with me here, verses 1 to 5. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes when Jesus got out of the boat. A man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. And this man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. I'm going to come back to that word in a moment here, subdue. Night and day, among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Right away, right off the bat here, we are introduced to this unnamed man who, to put it mildly, is not in a good place. You know, there, there are places that you can end up in your life that you never experienced or planned on going. There are places you can end up, places that people end up in their life they never imagined they would be. And the text is clear here what's going on. This man is being demonically oppressed. We, we looked just briefly at uh, what de who demons are and some of what they do in, in, in a previous chapter. I'm not going to go into depth here with that. But the text is clear. This man is being demonically oppressed by evil spirits. Which, by the way, is not just something that happened back then. This is something that is very real and very pertinent and relevant today. It's not just something that happens over there on the other side. It's something that happens here as well, wherever there may be. And so this man, 
this man in the land of the Gerasenes, is essentially the walking dead. He is physically alive, but, but mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and relationally, he is dead inside. He's living among the tombs, amongst the dead. You know, this individual is in, in so much pain, so much torment, so much pain runs deep in him. Not only has he been tormented by these evil spirits, he has been outcast by his family, by his community. He is not allowed to live with his people any longer. There's a Scottish theologian named John Swinton who uh, at one time earlier uh, years ago was a practicing nurse uh, in the field of mental health and um, with people with dementia. And he tells us, he says, you become who you are through your relationships. You become who you are through your relationships. Now, this is not just tied to our relationships with people. Of course, he's talking about our relationship with God as well. But we often like to think of ourselves as these, these independent, completely autonomous individuals who have the freedom and the ability to choose and shape and form our lives the way that we would so want to. But the truth is, is that our lives are shaped and formed and impacted by the lives of those around us. Ms. Swinton says that neurologically speaking, upwards of 70% of, if I can just put in quotes, you, what makes you you, is actually shaped by your interactions with other people from birth all the way through your life. And now I'm not, I'm not going to venture right now at this moment into the waters of talking about mental health this morning. I, I actually don't think it's going to be helpful to do so given this passage because this passage isn't talking about that. It's talking about demonic oppression. But I do realize that there is at times an overlap between the two. That the demonic will sometimes use the physical chemical realities that are happening in our brains, in our minds, and he'll use that as leverage to take us away from community, away from people, away from God himself. And so there is sometimes where there is this overlapping coexisting between the demonic and the mental health. But I, we're not going to go there this morning. So possessed, tormented, this man has been chased out of town. He's forced to live in an, in an unimaginable setting amongst the tombs and graves outside of town. Matthew's gospel tells us that, that for a long time, this man had not worn clothes and he had not lived in a house, but had lived among the tombs, and it's, it's just heartbreaking. And I don't just mean that in a way to, to try to conjure up some kind of sympathy or empathy for a man who lived 2,000 years ago, but I, I say so because it's, it's a heartbreaking picture of how so many people in our society live today, the experiences of so many people, the isolation, the alienation, the, the loneliness and self-hatred that people can live with, the broken and damaged relationships that are seemingly beyond repair, and those who are cast into oblivion by those closest to them. In his 17th century poem, there was a man named John Milton who famously came up with a word to describe what he pictured as being, you know, imaginatively thinking, the capital of hell itself. And it's this word that we call pandemonium. Pandemonium. It's the Latin word pan for all, the Greek demonium, talking about demons. It's the place of all demons. And our, our modern definition of pandemonium is something like this, a place or state of confusion, uproar, disorder, wildness, uncontained noise. And this man in this story is a miniature, you know, encapsulates in miniature what Milton was talking about with the word pandemonium. He is pandemonium in a literal living hell that he is experiencing. And sometimes, a, a lot of times actually, demonic experiences are actually surprisingly difficult to discern. They don't always come about in overt ways that we see in the, in the scriptures in this passage right here. Our enemy is cunning, he is sly, he is intelligent, he is a sneaky liar, and his ways are often camouflaged or disguised. That's why we call him a deceiver. There are times when we are not even aware that a demonic influence is infiltrating our, our lives or the lives of those around us. But there are moments, like we see in this 
passage this morning where the enemy plays his hand too much, too openly, and the nature of his kingdom of darkness is manifest in ways that are just plain as day to us. And so what we see here is the trajectory that the demons, that demons always seek to take people on, and that is to completely dehumanize and destroy people. There is no other end that they seek than to, dis- than to destroy and to dehumanize, to make people less than human, to smear and to show their disdain for the image of God that is imprinted on every human being. But part of the scenario, part of the problem here in this story doesn't just lie with the fact that there is demonic activity in this man's life. We would actually expect that if there are demons possessing him, that that would cause an issue. The problem, one of the main problems that I see here is not just that these demons are harassing him day after day, it's that they succeed in making his family, his community, his people believe that he is less than human, that he is far gone, that he is hopeless, and that he is someone to be terrified off and to write off and to cast off and never speak of again. And so what is so insidious here is not just that the demons oppress him, we expect that. What is so, so off here is that the community does so as well. Now, I've been, not just because it was Remembrance Day yesterday, but I've been watching some World War II documentaries um, recently just out of curiosity and just interest. And one of the things that you see, whether you watch a documentary of that or you talk to someone from that time period or you read a book about uh, the events that happened over those years, is that it wasn't just that evil was perpetrated by those that you kind of expected it to happen. There were times, not just in the Axis powers, but on the Allied side as well, when evil was perpetrated. There was times when there were civilians, whole societies, that would be wrapped up in the grips of evil and could do things that no one just months or years before thought was possible. And, and I think this is partly what we see in the story here this morning, is that Sometimes it's not just that we see demonic activity, it's that we see demonic activity fleshing itself out through a community. How awful that he would do that. So no one is strong enough to contain this man. In verse 4, it talks about this. No one was strong enough to subdue him. This word here is, 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 is the literal word to tame. It's the word that they use in the Greek to talk about taking wild animals and seeking to tame them and to subdue them. No one is strong enough to tame him. They are, he is being treated like an animal and he is responding like an animal. And so he is acting as if he's not even human anymore. To him, to, 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 to the people around him, he was like an animal, maybe even less than that. You know, I just want to say a quick note here about how the reason why this man was possessed, we don't have any, anything in the text that gives us a suggestion as to why he was possessed by these demons. Um, and so, you know, to, to, when we read the Bible, be careful not to place on people and on these stories things that we don't see in the text too overtly, right? Like, we can see this and we can say, well, he must have done this or this must have happened to him, or he must have opened himself up to the enemy in this way. We have no idea. And one of the interesting things is that Jesus never once in this story tells him to repent of sin. He doesn't tell him that he's forgiven. And so we don't know why this man was experiencing the torment that he was. But just a a thought there, just to say that sometimes people are simply casualties of the larger picture that we live in a fallen world. And, And sometimes there's, we can't make sense or rhyme or reason as to, why some people suffer in certain ways and others don't. But Ephesians 6 reminds us here that we don't do battle against flesh and blood, but rather we do that against what? Rulers, authorities, powers of dark forces, spiritual forces of evil. Our enemy does not like you. He does not like us. He does not like human beings. Specifically, he doesn't like human beings who submit to the reign and rule of Jesus in their lives. He hates us. What Jesus does when he comes to start his ministry, you see this in the Gospels, and he enters in that synagogue on that day in Capernaum, or in Nazareth, sorry, and he 
opens up the scroll of Isaiah, and he proclaims that one of the reasons he came is to do what? To set the oppressed free. That is one of the aims and one of the goals that Jesus had in coming. That is one of the hallmarks of his kingdom, is that the oppressed would be set free. And this is just as relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago. And it makes me wonder, oh, when we think about this man's community and family, how do we at times treat others like this man? How do we beat or chain with our words and attitudes through berating, judging, condemning, making ourselves feel superior, or just simply through ignoring people? How do we cast people from our midst? How do we deny bearing any responsibility for what's happening in their lives. It's so easy to exonerate ourselves, to say, well, that's not my problem. And all this does is just pushes people to the edges of society and to the edges of themselves, as we see in this story. But here's Jesus landing on the shores of this man's hilltop tomb experience. <laughs> and he comes, and you can just imagine, like I said, Jesus' disciples at this moment, you're in a, in a foreign place. The towns in the area are not like you. They don't serve the God that you know. They don't have the same worldview that you do. And immediately upon arriving, this possessed man comes running down the hill naked. Like, that would get your attention. <laughs> that would get your attention. He comes running up to Jesus, and he falls on his knees before him. In verse 7, it says this here. Sorry, I don't have that there, but we'll, we'll, we'll turn it in your inner Bible. It says here, He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. One, one of the songs that we sang just earlier, yeah, the song No Body, has this, this line that is just it's absolute fire, I think. Darkness, your hour is over. Darkness, your hour is over. And if I can just speak that to someone here who is feeling like you're in the midst of darkness, Jesus is coming to your shores this morning, and he is saying to you, darkness, your hour is over. Darkness, your hour is over. We're approaching Advent and Christmas time, of course, here in the coming weeks, and John 1, 4 is this beautiful beginning to his gospel where he talks about the mystery of the incarnation, the mystery of Jesus becoming human, taking on flesh, embodied in a human man. And that's what, human, that's what Christmas is about, of course. But John 1, 4 says this well-known line. It says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You know, the birth of Christ was him showing up on the shores of our world in general. But now he goes out into the world, specifically in this story, to attend to a specific person, to shine light into his darkness, because the hour of darkness is over. This man couldn't break the physical, he, he couldn't break the chains that he was in. Sure, he could break the physical chains that they would tie him in. He could break those chains and those bonds. But he would never be truly free until he met the chain breaker, the one who breaks chains by the very power of his name. And you might be able to break chains of a certain kind in your own life, so to speak, from time to time, depending on the day. You might be able to manage your addiction. You might be able to manage the challenges that you have, but you will never be completely free until you submit to and allow Jesus, the chain breaker, to set you free. And some of us here are, are, are suffering silently. Some of you do a really good job. I'm not pointing, I'm not thinking of anyone specifically, just so you know, I'm not pointing you out in my own mind. But some of us as people can do a really good job of putting a mask on, and on the outside, everything's fine, but on the inside is pandemonium. It is chaos. It is disorder. And you are looking and screaming out for freedom. Allow me to beg with you, don't leave this place without reaching out to someone without pulling someone aside, without asking for prayer, without confessing something, whatever needs to take place to put things out into the light and say, I do not want to live like this any longer. Allow me to beg with you, don't leave here without talking to someone, whether it be myself or someone else. Jesus does not want you to leave here 
without experiencing and tasting the freedom that he has for you. You know, we live in a fallen, broken world in desperate need of a, of a savior, of a healer. And the, the enemy is seeking, like I said, to leverage whatever challenges you're facing and to use it against us. And I, I want to just highlight one thing for us here this morning. We have upcoming uh, Norman, Norm Harrison and Craig Stretch are going to be running our, our men's Conquer series. We, we've, we've put that in the loop. We've, we announced it last Sunday. And, and this is a 14-week a study that, that, that really goes into depth, talking about issues around purity, sexuality in particular. And, and, and I want to encourage every single man in this place to consider coming to that. And that's not because I think necessarily every single man in this place is wrestling with that in this moment. But that's not the point. Could it be that the Lord would want to bring a community of men together, not just if you're in that place of need, but so that you can come around that person who is in need, a person who is being vulnerable and open in their brokenness. And they say, we're going to stand with you in this. We're going to walk through this together, and we're going to see this conquered in the name of Jesus as he sets you free. And so I, I want to just put this out there because I believe there could be two or three individuals here this isn't an issue for you, and you have not considered this. You thought, well, that's great they're doing that, but that's not for me. But I want to encourage you, maybe challenge you. Perhaps consider, pray about, talk to Norm, sign up for this, so you can come alongside of those who are journeying in that way. There's this moment where Jesus asks, in verse 9, this question. He says this, what is your name? What is your name? And, and I've always been taught or, or maybe just have imagined that Jesus is asking the name of the demon or demons that are inside this man. And I think it's possible that Jesus is asking for the name. But I also think it's possible that Jesus is asking for the name of this man. You know, we don't get the name of this man in this story. The, the demons right away, if Jesus is asking for the man's name, don't even hold that conversation with him. They direct it towards who they are and what they're doing. We are many. But you see, what if Jesus is asking the name of this man? I, I think it brings a whole different perspective to this story if he's doing so. Because if he's asking this man's name, he is seeking to rehumanize someone who is, has been dehumanized and ostracized by demons and humans alike. What Jesus is doing in asking this man's name is he is elevating human dignity, the dignity of this individual right here in front of him. He is seeing this man. He is seeking to know this man even before he is freed and healed. He looks into the eyes of this man. He sees this man who God has made in his image. He sees the identity and purpose and destiny that he was created for. And he seeks to know him in his brokenness. One of my favorite new authors recently is a man named David Brooks. And he just released a book called How to Know a Person, The Art of Seeing Others Deeply and Being Deeply Seen. Highly recommend it. And Brooks is a journalist and author from New York who, who came to faith in Christ some years back. And he, he just writes brilliantly on, on a whole bunch of different topics and interweaving the gospel into them. But in this book, he talks about how people can act in two ways. He says, either we, when we are interacting with other people— we are those who illuminate other people or we are those who diminish other people. Either you are illuminating someone by the way that you engage with them, give your attention to them, speak to them, listen to them, or you are someone who is diminishing them, either purposely or just through, through ignoring them or through not having a care in the world about them. He says, a diminisher makes people feel small, unseen. They view other people as things to be used, not as persons to be befriended. They stereotype and ignore. They are so involved with themselves that other people are just not on their radar screen. But an illuminator, he says, brings out the best in a person. They are extremely attentive, good listeners. They ask good questions. They read people well. They illuminate people. They make people feel seen and known. You know, it's said that I don't know who said it, but I've heard it before, said that paying attention 
is among the purest forms of love. Paying attention is among the purest forms of love. And Harvard psychologist Robert Keegan agrees, and he says this. He says, what the eye sees more deeply, not deeply, that's a typo, deeply, the heart tends to love more tenderly. What the eye sees more deeply, the heart tends to love more tenderly. In Romans 8, 38, 39 tells us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Do you know what the Greek word for nothing is? It translates to nothing. Nothing. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ. It talks about this. It says here, death, life, angels, demons, present, future, our fears, our worries, our anxieties, the things done to us, the things that we do, none of it. None of it puts us beyond the reach of a God who loves us and reaches down to us. Nothing. His love for you, his love for, for myself, today, right now, he is standing on the shores of our hearts and of our minds. And he is saying, I see you. I know you. There's this moment in the story, I'm just going to touch upon it briefly because it's such a scene. The demons beg Jesus to be allowed to go into a herd of pigs nearby. And pigs, of course, not a part of the, the Jewish diet, not a part of their kosher way of eating. And, but even beyond that, what the pigs would represent to these disciples, and to the Jewish people, was a reminder of the current occupation that they had under pagan rulers. The experience they were having under Rome at this time. It was a reminder to these disciples that they were, they were away from home. They were not where they belong. And here's a fascinating thing. Jesus left heaven, his home, to come for us. Jesus then takes his disciples away from their home across this lake to come to this, where this man was. And this man that they encounter, he has been outcast from his home and displaced and ostracized. He is not at home. One of the most beautiful moments in this gospel takes place after, of course, the pigs have their whole, like, head smashed in buffalo jump style thing that goes on there. And the herdsmen and the townspeople, they get all upset at Jesus. They're not just upset from an economic standpoint, but I think that rings true too. Like, seriously, you just threw 2,000 pigs into the sea. That was our, our whole economy right there. But, but here's, here's where it goes deeper. They, they're scared out of their minds. They're not just upset at Jesus on an economic level. They are scared out of their wits because they can't, they can't understand that this man is able to have authority over that which they were contending with for so long and, and, and had no, couldn't do anything other than to just send this man out of their midst. Luke 8 tells us in, in his account of the story, he says that they asked Jesus to leave because they were overcome with fear. They were more afraid of Jesus than they were of the demonic forces who stole their son, their brother, their friend, their neighbor. They, had, they were more tolerant of these malevolent forces that sought to destroy a man's life than they were of the man who came to set them free. And so here's where we get to this beautiful moment. Jesus, he, he actually, it's interesting, he obliges them. He actually says yes to the request. They say, leave. He says, okay. I'm going to leave. He gets back into his boat in verse 18. And then the man who had been set free begs to go with him, with the disciples and him back across. He wants to become a disciple of his. He wants to follow Jesus. It's a beautiful moment because this man, you can imagine, doesn't have a home to go back to. Here's this opportunity. And Jesus says, No. It's the only request in this story that Jesus doesn't grant. Why is this beautiful? Because of what Jesus says next. Look at here, verse 19. Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Go home. Go home. You know, if we, if, if we, if we read between the lines here, not, not to stretch this too far, but imagine this man desiring to follow Jesus because he has no home to return to. And the fact is, is that in this moment, Jesus is the one who brings him home. 
He's the one who makes it possible for him to return home. You know, we talk about, as followers of Jesus, we talk about how heaven is our home. And it's true. And, and, I, and, I, and I get the, the sentiment behind that and what, what we are getting at when we say that. But home is not just a place. Home is a person. Home is a person of Jesus Christ himself. That as we enter into relationship with him, we come home to the Father, our truest home that we can imagine, our truest sense of belonging. And, and, and this is at the most fundamental, basic level, the reason that Jesus came in the first place was to bring us home, to bring you home, to bring me home, to bring us home. Jesus doesn't bring the man with him. He does something extraordinary, perhaps even more extraordinary than expelling those demons from this man. What he does is he initiates the possibility that this man be reconciled with his family, with his community, with his people. And, and, and we can, you know, debate all the different ways of what it means to be healthy in our experiences here. But John Swinton, again, I think he says this well. He says, the ultimate thing that makes us healthy is to be in right relationship with God and with others. Ultimate health is going to come through our relationship with God and with others. Think about how this story began. Jesus, away from his own home, as it were, takes the disciples away from their home. And he, but it ends with Jesus and the twelve heading back home. This unnamed man who woke up that morning living in the tombs, experiencing his own hell, now he is himself free, and he is returning home. If I can return back to the story of, of Father Damien, this Belgian priest that I mentioned earlier. What Father Damien is most remembered for was, was not his preaching, it wasn't his teaching, it wasn't just the many social programs that he was a part of, but it was his willingness to sail from the capital city on Oahu and to sail to the little island of Molokai. Now, why, is this, why, why does this matter? Because Molokai at that time presented to him a significant risk. It was a penal colony, it was a leper colony. But this is what Father Damien said to those on Molokai upon arriving. These are his words to those suffering from leprosy. He says this. He says, I will be a father to you, one who loves you so much that he doesn't hesitate to become one of you, to live and die with you. And over the next decade plus, this seemingly ordinary man would care for these men, would treat them with whatever medical expertise he had. He would eat the food they ate. He lived with them. He prayed with them. He comforted those who were dying. He dug the graves of those who had passed, and he performed funerals. He wasn't just a pastor for them. He was a friend. And he endeavored to be like Jesus to those who were outcasts from society. If you look up Father Damien on the internet, you can find a picture of him in the, the months just before he sailed to Molokai. He's a man who's 33 years old. He's still got some youth in him. He's clean shaven. He's healthy. And then one of the final pictures that you would find if you were to look a little further, and I didn't grab the picture just because it's, it's graphic, it shows a disfigured man who, having spent all of those years amongst the lepers, contracted leprosy himself. He is disfigured beyond belief. He does not look like the same man. And this is a disease that would then take his life at just the age of 49 years old. He indeed lived with them. He indeed died among them. I'm going to invite the band to come up at this time here. You know, the movement of Jesus to this man in our story and the movement that he initiates for this man at the end of the story to go home is, is really like a microcosm of the gospel story itself. Jesus coming to us, loving us, seeing us in our need, pointing us to the Father, being willing to, to put his life on the line and being ultimately rejected all so that we might be able to be reconciled to God and made a part of his family, to come home to him. Love goes to great lengths for the other and, and, and love sees the other and love seeks to know the other. And, and I, could, I could end this message here right now just by encouraging us to be more loving to one another and 
I have some really surfacey things to say on that. Go, be kind people. But what I want to do instead is I don't want to end with a specific application per se. I want to end by pointing us to a specific subject for our attention and for our affection. Last week, we talked about how Jesus is, is our functional lead pastor. He is our shepherd. And, and he's someone who speaks to us and leads us, and he, he does so in real time. And so what I want to invite you to do is just to stand with us as the band is going to lead us in a final song here. And I want to invite you to close your eyes. And as we began this morning, if you are so comfortable, I want you to open your hands in a posture of receptivity. Jesus, we acknowledge your presence here. We believe that you speak through your words and by your spirit. And we ask that right now, in this 